الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We praise Allah the exalted and might the majestic and we ask him to exalt the mention and grant peace and send his salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his companions and all those who follow them on the path of righteousness until the day of recompense uh, We were discussing yesterday some hot stuff in regards to what should happen prior to marriage. And uh, we promised that there will be a continuation of the discussion as to what should happen after marriage. Therefore, before and after. Now, there's a huge difference between the two. And uh, many people, excuse me, do not prepare themselves mentally uh, or spiritually or sometimes even physically for what will come next and they assume that marriage is what they've seen in movies if they've been watching movies uh, I'm not going to mention any names in particular but uh, the truth of the matter is marriage is, is beyond that and marriage is a very important contract in Islam so much so that Allah Azza wa Jal called it Mithaqan Ghalidha Mithaqan Ghalidha It's this kind of contract that is so firm and so powerful that it has so many regulations that if Surah An-Nisa for example besides being named Surah An-Nisa because it deals with many of the issues pertaining to women it addresses many of the issues pertaining to marriage, divorce, and so on and so forth. Surah At-Talaq is about divorce. And if you actually scan the Quran, you will find that there are many suwar or segments of suwar dedicated to this particular issue. Therefore, signifying the importance of this matter. And sadly, some people don't realize the gravity of this contract. And so... They, they think it's just a matter of, you know, just, it's a, it's a sexual thing, okay? You know, a young man, he watches a few wrong movies and sees a few ladies walking down the street and now he feels, I, I need to get married. Well, I can't take it anymore. Khalas, this is too much. I can't fast and I cannot do this and I, I need to get married. And he thinks that marriage is only like, that's it. And once you've, you're finished, then what? Then what? Yeah, that does solve one aspect of the needs of men and vice versa. But marriage is so much beyond that, that after the fulfillment of the rights of both husband and wife, uh, there are other responsibilities which have to be taken into consideration. Now, the nature of the marriage in Islam has been best described by Allah Azza wa Jal. And when Allah describes something, then don't ask for any further description from a human being, including the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because the description of Allah is the speech of Allah. The speech of Allah. And the speech of Allah is, is not like the speech of human beings. The, the profound meanings that you find therein, the, the eloquence, the choice of words, the sequence of words, Everything has been chosen by the Creator Himself who created languages, who created the human being who speak these languages. So when Allah Azza wa Jal says about the men and women, husband and wife, Hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahun. Hunna libas. Libas is what each one of you is wearing now. You are clothing for them and they are clothing for you the women are clothing for the men the men are clothing for the women say well I usually don't put on my wife before I go outside I put on a jacket so how could the, the wife be a clothing for me and I, I don't understand what, what's being said let's analyze what clothing does what does clothing do if you're cold it keeps you warm so if you're working in a particular, you have a job that, you know, there's a lot of hazard, hazardous issues and stuff and nails 
then you wear particular equipment that will protect you from these things. Um, human beings generally, unless they're abnormal, don't like to be naked. You know, you, you just can't just like open a door and you, you know people have had this dream. It's like the most common dream that you're walking naked down the street and then you try to run away and you couldn't find a place to run. Then you wake up and you find that you're still in bed. You say, Alhamdulillah, I hope I don't have that dream again. But, um, you know, unless it's one of these, you know, soccer matches where someone suddenly runs into the, the field, you know, naked and trying to catch some attention, you, you can't really be naked. This feels odd. This is a human nature. That's why even يعني, a woman who, who may be uh, يعني, as wicked as a woman can be, and she's wearing the, the shortest skirt, if a wind blows, if some wind blows she will, and, and the skirt flies up, she will naturally try to cover. But ma, you were naked just a second earlier. يعني, what, what is the difference now? Suddenly the modesty kicked in. No, this is fitra. This is fitra. That you know, being naked is something that is unusual. So clothing gives you a sense of security. You put on your clothes and you can go out and face. When someone knocks on your door and you're wearing your undergarment, you know, like your pants, you know, the underpants and undershirt, then you have the tendency to go put on a thawb or put on your garment and now you feel comfortable to open the door, see who it is. Otherwise, you don't feel comfortable. So this is, a, this is the sense of clothing. This is what clothing does for human beings. So then the husband is supposed to provide this for the wife. And the wife is supposed to provide that for the husband. You should find with her security. You should find with her comfort. You should find with her warmth. Huh? All of these, all of these qualities which you get from libas should be found in both spouses. Therefore Allah described them as they are clothing for you and you are clothing for them. This is the foundation upon which marriage is established. If this foundation does not exist, do not anticipate a successful marriage. And the objective of marriage is not merely fulfilling sexual needs. The objective of marriage is helping one another go to, go to Jannah. Ultimately, any, any construction that is not founded on the taqwa of Allah and that which will get us closer to Allah, it might as well not exist. It might as well not exist. So how many of us, when they are preparing themselves mentally and financially to get married, are actually reflecting on these facts? How many think, okay, am I going to be able to fulfill the, the needs of my wife? Am I able to take care of her? Am I, am I able to look after her? Am I able to establish my house on taqwa? Am I going to be clothing for her? Is she going to be clothing for me? Or is it just the, the wedding night and the celebration? And then we will deal with the rest later. That, that's the human mentality. Yeah, but then inshallah, once we get in, I will figure it out. And very often you don't figure it out. And then you get out. And the divorce ends. The, the, the marriage ends with divorce. So it is necessary that we agree on some uh, principles and some pillars. First of which, the marriage is built on taqwa. Second of which, that should be a means of clothing each other. In a sense, in, in the non-tangible sense. In the spiritual sense as well. The husband and wife should help each other get closer to Allah. Now, when we speak about the marital life, we know that there are rights for the husband, right? And of course, male speakers often address the topic of the rights of the husband. And uh, the usual reaction from the sisters is, excuse me. So you're always speaking about the rights of the man, the rights of the man. Where are the rights of the woman? So we'll say, don't worry sisters, we have taken that into consideration. Therefore, we will deal with Common rights between both, the shared rights. And then we will speak about the rights of the husband and then we will speak about the rights of the wife. So that it is not a one-sided one -sided discussion. That only the brothers get his right and then we don't know what the sisters deserve and therefore we don't fulfill it. Because that's one of the most common problems is that we only look for our own interest. 
Yeah, so you're not, do, you're not giving me my rights. Yeah, but you're not giving me my rights either. So, you know, the way you treat it, you will be, the way you treat, you'll be treated. It's, uh, it's this way it goes. So among the shared uh, rights is good manners. Good manners. And if you would like to know more about good manners, then I invite you to watch uh, the most recent lecture on One Way to Paradise, uh, titled The Subtle Technique. The Subtle Technique. It's actually a breakdown of what, good, what are good manners in Islam and how to acquire them and so on and so forth. So uh, go to onewaytoparadise.net, onewaytoparadise.net, which will take you to the YouTube channel. And from there, you can watch the lecture, The Subtle Technique. It breaks down good manners. But the hadith which we will refer to right now, uh, you know, for, for brevity purposes, is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, specifically regarding the family, where he said, خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ He, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, the best among you, the best among you are those who are best to their spouses, to their wives. And I am the best to my wives. Why would the Prophet Sallallahu say that? Why would he make that expression to the Sahaba? Because he knows that he is addressing people who would want to do exactly what he does. Who took him as an example. No one, in his, no one would think the Messenger of Allah is showing off or trying to speak about himself in this fashion. They understood that behind that there's an objective for, for raising them and teaching them how they're supposed to be and telling them that I'm not only speaking about it, I'm living it up. Which is where speakers often fail. Speakers, people dua, triyukh, may, may tell the people about it and then fail in doing it themselves. So we ask Allah to protect all of us, the speakers and the audience, from falling into this trap. That's why this reminder serves as a reminder for the speaker and the audience. Because we all have some shortcomings here and there. But the objective is the best of us are those who are best to their families. We will get some examples later, inshallah. The, the second shared quality between, the both is, uh, between both of them is what? Truthfulness, sidq. And the general ayah, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ Oh, you have believed, be mindful of Allah and be among the truthful. Both the husband and the wife have to be tr truthful. Now, does Islam allow lying when it comes to spouses? Yes or no? You guys are big liars. <laughs> but that's correct. You're big liars to your family, that's fine. Yes, actually, there's a, some, some, con, some concession. Concession, yani rukhsa, means an exception to the rule. Now, of course, the problem is when someone takes the concession and makes it the rule. It's an exception to the rule, so they make the exception the rule, so they become liars. No. What does it mean that one may lie to his wife or a wife may lie to her husband? It is not that um, he starts going out with the secretary and then, you know, he's in, and he lies, obviously. And then if she asks him, no, 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 I'm not going out with anyone. Say, brother, you know, say, well, like, you know, I'm allowed to lie. Yeah, but you're not allowed to be doing anything else. And this is not the kind of lying which is allowed. What is intended here is the, you know, they call them white lies, even though we really don't have this racism in, in lies. Okay, all lies are haram, regardless of what color they have. Just in case someone misunderstood. If it's a lie, it's a lie. But the idea, the concept of a white lie is, is what is understood. Otherwise, in other areas, it doesn't apply. There's no such thing as white lie outside the marriage contract. Unless it is warfare, obviously. And if you're trying to reconcile between the two, these are the other two exceptions. For example, um, women like to experiment in the kitchen. Okay? Especially nowadays, every other post on Facebook is some new recipe. So you become like, you know, the, the mouse in the lab that they run all these tests on and you know to see what will affect it. you and the, the husband sometimes is a victim for the many experiments of the wife so she goes into the kitchen and puts some funky stuff together that should never be together you know what I mean and she comes up with this ridiculous horrible dish you know that you would pay money not to eat but then again, you know that she spent two hours doing that thing. And if you were to tell her, 
you know what you want to tell her? You're going to hurt her feelings. Huh? So this is when you are permitted to lie. Now when you lie, you have to lie diplomatically. Otherwise, you get yourself in trouble. Yeah, and you don't go out of the way and say, MashaAllah, this is beautiful. Because she's going to make it every day. <laughs> then every day you're going to be in the same predicament. Say, MashaAllah, this is very nice. And we should give some to the neighbors. Okay? <laughs> so you can get rid. And let's have this once, you know, every now and then. It's not really my type of thing, you know, to eat often. I prefer what my, you know, my mother used to cook back, you know, back in the days. And so you try to, in a nice, thick way, make her realize that this was not your favorite meal without necessarily hurting her feelings. That's what is intended by a lie. Because you really don't like the food. And for the woman, it's, the, it's something else. You know, sometimes uh, the husband may have some, you know, as they say, color blind. He doesn't really, you know, get the colors right. So he wears some red pants with a green shirt and an orange hat. You know, he looks like a rainbow or something. And, uh, you know, he posed in front of his wife, how do I look? And she knows he looks, you know, ridiculous. I says, mushroom, not bad, mashallah. You know, that looks pretty nice. How about you wear that other suit, you know, you got the other day, you know, just because you're going to meet different people. So this is a form of lie which is permitted. That's it. The kind of lies which will keep harmony. Keep harmony amongst the spouses. Not that they lie every day about everything in order to keep harmony. That becomes abnormal. Otherwise, we have to be truthful. Thirdly, uh, mercy, forgiveness, kindness, uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said to Aisha, O oh, Aisha, indeed Allah is kind and loves kindness. Allah is kind and He, love, he loves kindness. And uh, being kind is a quality that uh, a Muslim husband specifically must have. Because the, it depends on the cultures which we come from. And obviously we come from many different cultures. In many cultures, the husband is the, the, the chief in command. And he's the president. And he's the general, and he's the mudir, and he's the dictator from the end. And he feels that the house is his throne, and that everybody is subservient, and they're just there to execute his wishes on the spot. And so he becomes just a person who's issuing commands all the time, and the wife is supposed to just carry them out all the time. Uh, and therefore that becomes difficult for the wife. And this is an element where kindness is missing. Now you can still have certain requirements, and ask them in a kind way. Ask them in a kind way. We have to have mercy. The Prophet ﷺ said, uh, مَن لَا يَرْحَمْ لَا يُرْحَمْ It's a very dangerous thing. He who does not show mercy shall not be shown mercy. And who's the one who shows mercy? Allah Jalla Jalalu. So eliminating mercy will make us dip, be deprived of the mercy of Allah. And without the mercy of Allah, no one is going to Jannah. <coughs> right or wrong? Can anyone enter Jannah without the mercy of Allah? Never. The Prophet ﷺ said to the Sahaba, none of you shall enter Jannah because of his good deeds. They understood, okay, because of their deeds are not sufficient. That was the understanding of the Sahaba. They said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah, maybe we're not qualified, but you are qualified. Your good deeds are qualified qualify you to enter Jannah. He said, not even me. Unless Allah engulfs me. Allah encompasses me with His mercy. So the mercy of Allah has to be there for the effectiveness of the good deeds. That's why la'na, being cursed, which means being deprived of the mercy of Allah is the biggest calamity. When Allah curses someone in the Quran, يَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّاعِنُونَ أَوْ إِلَىٰ أَخِرِيَ مِنَ الْأَحَدِيثِ that we will deal with inshallah later. When someone is cursed in Islam, a man who resemble women, women who resemble men, uh, women who wear wigs, those who pluck their eyebrows, those who you know, wear perfume, those who have, we will deal with the, some of the descriptions, those who are dressed yet naked, those are cursed. And being cursed means no mercy from Allah. So which Jannah do we want to enter? Becomes a very serious issue that we need to reflect on. Uh, fourthly, Avoiding oppression. Avoiding oppression. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inna dhulma, dhulumatin al qiyamah. Verily, oppression will be a source of multiple darkness. Darkness upon darkness on Yawm al qiyamah. And you know, if you read the Quran, that among the qualities of the believers, that nuruhum yasa, 
بين أيديهم وعن أيمانهم that those who believe their light will illuminate before them before them and on their right so the only way a person can actually go over the sirat and can manage on yawm al qiyamah and in, in, in the calamities which will happen would be light it will be light without the light like the munafiqeen they will be left in pitch black they will not be able to see they will not be able to follow the believers they will not be able to make it to paradise because they have been deprived of light and so if zulm is dhulumat yawm al qiyamah not one darkness it's plural zulma is one darkness zulumat you know some say darknesses but last time i checked in the dictionary there's no such word there's no such word as darknesses it, it remains to be singular either way but it's multiple darkness many 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 so we cannot afford an oppression how many how many husbands oppress their wives today or vice versa it's it's a very common phenomenon among the muslims and and you know having received emails from both uh, you know husbands and wives uh, if you read the contents of these emails you would not believe i sometimes don't believe what i'm reading uh, what's going on what kind of relationship is this a man who doesn't pray you know and he doesn't doesn't fear allah in his home and he's you know doing all kinds of things to his wife beating her up every day beating up the children fighting with the neighbors a'udhu billah like a shaitan this is how it deals and the wife suffers and the children suffer and everybody suffers and it's not like this is something that you know like a tantrum which he has every now and then no no this is his standard conduct he is like this on daily basis even on the day of Eid and any day where there's supposed to be a joyful occasion and you know take it easy on the family no no it's all the same now, this is major oppression what kind of marriage is this? this person has to deal with a lot you see the dhulm between one person and Allah this one is actually easier to manage than the dhulm between you and the creatures because if one of us wrongs himself then this falls under the maghfirah of Allah Azza wa Jal and the tawbah if one if Allah if we do tawbah it's erased or even if we don't do tawbah we may die wal'iyadhu billah in this state and be resurrected with this dhulm against ourselves and Allah may forgive that person Yawm Al Qiyamah. No one has any say. But the rights of the people will never go away. The rights of the people have to be paid back on Yawm Al Qiyamah. It doesn't fall under the Maghfirah. So people will have to do Qisas, huh? Retribution. So what you took from someone, then they will take it back from you on Yawm Al Qiyamah. However, the, the currency is different. Now you may take, you may steal a hundred riyas from someone and get away with it. And if they were to catch you, if they were to catch you, you would have to pay him back. How much? You stole a hundred riyas. You get caught. Says, give me, my, give me the money back. How much do you have to pay? Hundred. You give him 150, that's riba. Hundred. Which is fine. That, that's what you got. But on Yawm Al Qiyamah, what will that person take from you? Hasanat. Hey, you've been working all this time fasting in Ramadan and praying at night and doing all this, and you're collecting these hasanat, which we don't know which one of, of which were accepted by Allah. No one gets a receipt that says, you know, congratulations on this last salah. Uh, you know, the angels have written it as an acceptable salah. No one knows. You pray and hope that Allah will accept. You're keeping it real. You cannot say that anyone, no one can say, that my salah has been accepted. If Ibn Umar himself, عنه, said, if I knew that Allah only accepted two rak'at from me, I would have depended on them. Because Allah says, إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ إِنَّمَا is a term of exclusivity. Meaning, verily Allah only accepts the deeds of the righteous people. So he, he said, if, if, then, if Allah accepted two rak'at, that means I'm from the muttaqin. If I'm from the muttaqin, I have nothing to worry about. But Ibn Umar couldn't say that. So what are we going to say? So the person will take away from the good deeds. Five. You had in your bank account huh, of the Akhirah, you had a million good deeds. And you've wronged so many people. And they continue to take from your good deeds until you ran out. Does it end there? No. In the hadith in Bukhari, in Muslim, the hadith of uh, Abu Huraira about the Muflis, the bankrupt from the Ummah, it mentions that after this person runs out of good deeds, 
and he still hasn't paid back the people their rights, then the people will take from his, no, the people will, their bad deeds will be taken from them and they will be placed on him or her and then he will be thrown into the fire. Yeah, and he didn't commit these sins. He did not commit these sins. He ran out of good deeds and he still hasn't paid people their rights. Their bad deeds will be taken away from them and he will have to carry the burden then he will wind up in the hellfire. So this is the nature of dhulm which we may be taken lightly and we think, Wallah, this is a big deal. This requires 10 lectures for the husband and wife to understand what dhulm means and how they could be doing dhulm against each other. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Hadith Qudsi that, Ya ibadi, inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharraman fala tadhalamu. O oh my slaves, I have made dhulm forbidden upon myself. If Allah willed, He could have not. If Allah wanted to oppress the creation, can anyone stop Allah? If Allah willed to throw someone in the hellfire even though they committed no sin, can anyone object to that? No one can object. No one has the authority. What, what authority do you have? But it's the mercy of Allah that He made that haram upon Himself. Subhanah. He would never oppress anyone, not even mithqalu dharra. Not even the weight of an atom, of a grain, never. Everything is with adil and justice. And because of that, Allah said, and I've made it forbidden amongst you. So do not oppress one another. So I advise the brothers and the sisters to fear Allah and to avoid all kinds of oppression. Understand the rights of each other and give the rights to the best of your abilities. And we're not saying there will be no shortcomings. The husband will have shortcomings. The wife will have shortcomings, which we will rectify. When we are wrong, we admit that we are wrong. But to be living the life of oppressing one another is unacceptable. Avoiding argument. That's a tough one. That's a very tough one. How are you not going to argue? Right? There's a joke here. They say that, uh, you know, a, a man got married to this woman who, who loves to nag. Okay? You know, nagging. Always making requests. We need potatoes. We need tomatoes. We need this. Change the couch. Change the curtain. Jump on the balcony. Do ten push-ups. Yeah, sure, sure. Do I? Give me a break. Yeah. I have things to do. Always nagging, nagging, right? So the guy f got fed up with this lifestyle. Said, you know, lady, we have to do something about this. One day for me. One day for you. Hello. You can nag on alternate days. One day you nag, and one day you spare me from nagging. I don't want to hear a word. Okay. So she said, deal. You got yourself a deal. One day I will nag, one day I will not nag. So the day of nagging came. So she was nagging all day and he kept telling himself, tomorrow, inshallah, <laughs> let her finish. Tomorrow I'll have a peace of mind. So now he's anticipating tomorrow. Then the next day came. Then what happened? She started telling him, tomorrow I'm going to nag. Tomorrow I'm going to nag. Tomorrow I'm going to nag. So... She was nagging on the day. She wasn't nagging now. She's telling him that tomorrow she will nag. The bottom line is that every day she was nagging. So, uh, and so because of that, it becomes difficult not to argue. But sometimes, you know, the, the husband or the wife, you know, they have to be passive. If you're not passive, you can never survive. Even with your friends, with people at work. You know, life is full of, yeah, I mean, you come across people that really drive you berserk. And if you're not passive, you will suffer. Every, you know, if you pick on every little thing, it, life becomes very difficult to lead. Therefore, some things the lady says, you know, as they say, let it go from this ear and right out of the other one. Khalas, <laughs> yani, let it slide. You're going to pick on every word because some people, mashallah, tabarakallah, yeah, and he's a professional in analysis. Yeah? She tells him one sentence. You are right. And then he gives her eight lectures about the statement, you are right. Yes, of course I am right. When my mother, when I was 18 years old, my mother told me that I was right. And then I knew when I go to school, I would be right. Yeah, she, khalas. she was, you're right, okay. That's your halak. You're going to tell her now about all of your achievements that you made in life because you're right. She will never tell you you're right again. Next time she says you are wrong. And then, you know, you have to deal with you being wrong. So, you know, let it slide. As they say, just, just ignore it. Some things that happen, just be passive about them and you'll enjoy your life much better. Uh, among the, uh, just please the sound, I'm, I'm very picky about sounds, I'm sorry. Uh, the other last quality, oh no, before the last, is uh, aiding one another. 
aiding. As Allah said, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ And aid one another in bir. What is bir? Bir is righteousness. Bir is a lot. A lot of righteousness. Taqwa is fear of Allah. So one has to do with doing good and taqwa has to do with avoiding when, when they come together. When they come uh, separately, bir means bir and taqwa. And when taqwa comes alone, taqwa means taqwa and bir. But when they come together, they have different meanings. Bir becomes doing good and taqwa becomes avoiding the wrong and the harm and the evil. So Allah commands that we should aid one another in bir and taqwa. And then he says, وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ And do not aid one another in sin and transgression. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ And then fear Allah. So the husband has to help the wife, fear Allah. And the wife has to help, help the husband, fear Allah. How does a husband help his wife, fear Allah? That it is the obligation of the man to ensure that his wife is dressed properly. It's your responsibility, which Allah will ask you about on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. The lady will be asked for her own violation, for her own short shortcoming, and you as a husband will be asked about not fulfilling the right of making sure that your wife is dressed properly. And very many men are very much easygoing in this regard. Say, Ani, I don't, I let her, let, let her come from her heart and let her come from. But by the time you finish, by the time she's ready, yani, you already have a million problems you have to deal with. So there are times when you have to be firm. Now we're not saying that you impose without explanation. No, of course you educate her, you explain to her the evidences from the Quran and Sunnah, you, you treat her nicely in, as means of encouragement, but don't make this the basis because that may not be accomplished as soon as you want. In fact, she may never respond to you. So there will be a time when you have to impose this. You will have to impose this. This is one example, of course, many can be said. Another one, and the most important one, is Salah. Salah. وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا صح? Allah Azza wa Jal said, and command your family to enjoin and perform the salah and be patient. Be patient in doing so. وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ You have to command them to pray. Some husbands see that, you know, it's Salah time and his wife is still cooking and after she's cooking, she's washing and after she's washing, she's ironing and after she's ironing, Maghrib came in and Asr ended. And he says, يعني, she's busy with the chores and so on and so forth. لا يا شيخ. As soon as the time of the Salah comes, tell her, my wife, Barakallah Fiki, take a break. Take, leave the dishes alone. They're not going to run away from the sink. Huh? Go perform your Salah, finish and come back. You have to be involved. Now if you're sitting there watching TV wallah, with, you know, when, with your leg on the couch and she's sitting there washing the dishes and the kids are jumping on the balcony and screaming downstairs and yalla. It's like, a, it's, not, it's not a Muslim household anymore. It's not a Muslim household. Where is, where is the enjoying the good, forbidden, the evil? Where is the application? So this has to be implemented. And the sister, the same thing. You know, her husband, mashallah, tabarakallah, could be like a gorilla. You know, if he sleeps, uh, it's uh, haram to touch him. Yeah, mhandis, it's fajr. He elbows her, knocks her out of the bed. Sheikh, she never wakes him up again. Said, let him sleep before he beats me up. He gets upset. You have to wake up for salah. Praise Allah that Allah, you know, gave you a second alarm. You have the alarm and then your wife, which is much better in this regard. Someone is actually looking after you for you to wake up for salah. What are you upset about? What are you upset about? What do you get upset for? Even if you're cranky when you wake up, she's waking you up for salah. Now, if she's waking you up for another reason, which sometimes happens, then we understand if you can get upset. Because sometimes, you know, the ladies don't really evaluate things properly. You know, you're, you're tired, you're exhausted, you just barely made it home. And you know, as soon as you knock in on bed, and she wakes you up and you're like, what? I said, we need eggs. <laughs> Haram. Sleep. Tomorrow we can get eggs. Later we can get eggs. I'm just letting you know so you won't forget. I'm going to go back to sleep. I'm going to forget. And you think I'm going to dream about the eggs in my, in my sleep and wake up and go get them daydreaming. Let it happen later. And he said, the sister has to realize when to bother her husband and when to wake him up for salah. These two are not the same. 
It doesn't mean that every time she wakes you up, it's okay. There are times when you have to leave the man to rest. He's the one out there working, he's dealing with people, he's been driven crazy all day, and he needs to come home and get some rest to be able to function afterwards. So the, the wife has to make sure the kids are quiet, that you know nothing is loud, nothing is disturbing him. This is her job, to give him that peace of mind, that security, so he can have a good sleep. Otherwise, she will pay for it later. Uh, among the shared rights is um, uh, safeguard in the family. Both have to look after the children and uh, give them their Islamic rights. Of course, very often the woman has more to offer because she's with the kids more. You know, the husband is working all day, so she's the one at home. If That's why we were speaking yesterday about marrying a righteous woman. Because a righteous woman will at least bear in mind the importance of Islamic education and Islamic upbringing. Therefore, she will look after the children properly. A woman who doesn't care about the deen, she will raise children who don't care about the deen. And this is why we don't advise any Muslim ever, ever to marry a Jew or a Christian woman, even though it's permitted in Islam. Allah allowed Muslim men to marry Al-Kitabiyat. The, the ladies, you know, from the people of the book provided that they are chaste and so on and so forth. Uh, but that is not ad advised, that's not advised. Because very often, if she's a staunch Christian, uh, you know, how, she, how are you going to teach his children Quran and everything when she herself, you know, is, is not involved in this? And you are out all the time. So, you know, don't to be too lenient with the concept of marrying a lady from the people of the book because you met her somewhere. You know, a Muslim woman, a righteous Muslim woman is much more qualified and more deserving to be the mother of your children. Okay? So now we jump on to the uh, wife's obligations towards her husband. Not the lady's favorite topic. I know. And uh, usually we get a lot of heat after this discussion. And sometimes, you know, uh, assassination threats. And, uh, you know, things of the sort that we will catch you wherever you go. Uh, but, you know, fi sabilillah. Huh? I'm going to have to just take this risk and, and break it down. The first thing which the sisters do not love to hear, and the reason why they do not love to hear this is because they have not yet understood Islam. If they understood Islam, they will have no problem with any of the things which will be said. Uh, is the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal gave men... Uh, the responsibility and the uh, a degree over women. Men are a degree over women. They are the ones who are responsible for women. They are the caretakers of women and not the other way around. Now if you, in the world now they're pushing all these women rights, women rights and equality and women rights and equality and many of our sisters in Islam have been successfully brainwashed by this weird ideology that men and women are the same and equal and they should be given equal rights and equal treatment and equal batikh and this is, this is incorrect. Batikh is watermelon. You'll hear me say that often. Uh, this is not correct. Uh, on the face of it, okay, just from a, from a logical point of view, you put a man and woman next to each other. Do they look the same? Physically, are they the same? Emotionally, are they the same? They're not the same in anything except that they're both human beings. Honestly, the commonality between the two is merely that they're both human beings. As far as everything else, they are very often opposites. Yeah, and even in the creation, I'm not going to be explicit. You, 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 know, you understand what I'm saying. In the nature of the creation, they are made to be opposites. And in this way, opposites attract. In this regard, sometimes opposites repel. Like Tawheed and Shirk, they don't attract each other. These opposites repel. But genders, male and female, these opposites attract. Why are not women, why aren't they the ones in charge? Why the men? Let's be honest. Don't be scared, brother, even if your wife's upstairs. Huh? Hmm? Strength and safety. Mashallah, mashallah. <laughs> strength and safety. Well, strength, I understand. What about safety? Like they're safe, men are safe? Ah, they provide safety. Tayyib, barakallah feek. Actually, to cut the, you know, through the chase, Allah already told us in the Quran, why? When Allah, الرِّجَالُ قَوَّمُونَ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ Why? Who knows the ayah? 
Anyone knows the ayah? Fadal. That's it. Two reasons. Men are the caretakers, the ones in charge, the, one respon the ones responsible for women. Because of what Allah has made in terms of favoring some over others. Done deal. This is Allah. Allah favored in this regard the men over the women. Not, the, not in regards to the life to come. In the life to come, any believing man or woman who do good deeds, believe and do good deeds, are entitled to enter Jannah. Sahih? مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ فَلَنُحْيَنَّهُ For example, حَيَاتًا طَيِّبًا In this ayah. So in this regard, whoever does good deed, whether male or female, they're equal in this sense. Otherwise, Allah Azza wa Jal gave the men, the men that kind of superiority, because Allah فَضَّلَ بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضُ وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ And because of what they have spent out of their wealth. Don't go far. Can a business, who's the mudir? When you get hired by the company, when you get hired by the company, who is the mudir? The one who pays or the one who receives the pay? We're talking about the top of the hierarchy. The, the one who pays money, that's the mudir. صح? So who pays? Who's supposed to pay in the relationship? The man. And therefore, just like in a business, the one who pays is in charge. You don't find the employee running the business even though he gets money from the boss. This is the same thing. Secondly, can a business function without management? No. You can have the best product in the world. And you can have, you know, all that you can think about if you don't have a management, people managing other people, no business can succeed. And don't you have to have one CEO, one guy who's running the whole show? You must have. So a household is like a business. There must be one person in charge. Otherwise, nothing will get done. The husband says, Wallah, we're going to send this, the children to, uh, you know, X school. And the wife says, no, 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 we're going to send it to Y school. We're going to send them to Y school. If there was no one who is in charge with authority to make decision, where would the kids go? To Z school. Or they would... Split in half, they will get lost. One day he goes to this school, the next day he goes to that school. Oh, yeah, and he, someone has to be able to give the final word. No, they go into X school, it means they go into X school. Now, of course, the fact that Allah gave men this authority does not mean that He applies it in this fashion. Where He says, I said they go into X, I don't want to hear anything. No, you try to come to agreement, to common terms with you and your wife, have a fruitful you know, constructive discussion. Let's discuss it, you know, this is my point of view, and work it out. Even though you have the authority, don't display it. Don't rub it in her face as they say. I told you I'm the one in charge, you just have to obey me. Don't do that. Rather try to bring her to you as if you're doing her a favor. Or as if she's doing you a favor. Not a matter of you imposing on her your opinion if you want to lead a successful life. But the men are in charge of the women. In another ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal also said, وَلِلْرِّجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ دَرَجَةٌ And men have a degree of responsibility and authority over, over men. Daraja that Allah Azza wa Jal gave them. And so sisters, don't be upset. This is what Allah chose. And there's one default answer. And I hope you learn this one. If you've learned anything from these two, three days, learn this. Learn this. Because you will, you will deal with this often when dealing with Muslims and non-Muslims. When someone objects to the deen of Allah, non-Muslims say, how come four wives? How come women have to cover themselves? How come you have fighting? How come you have this? How come, how come? All these questions. They're always objecting. Why this and why that? They, these are people who are not pleased with Allah. At the, at the end of it, at the end of it, they're not happy with what Allah revealed. They have a, an objection to Allah. So, and or the sisters, they may object to the deen of Allah, say, I don't, I don't like this thing, it's injustice that Allah gave men a degree, Allah, we should all be the same. Anyone who gives you or makes similar expressions, tell him one thing. Say, look, I understand where you're coming from. I understand where you're coming from. So you're saying that there's, you have an issue with the current system? The current system is not good? Yeah, it's not good. Okay. Um, why don't you go and create heavens and earth of your own 
Go make your own heavens and earth and then create your own mankind and apply upon them the rules which you think are most befitting. Okay? And when you're done, call me. I would like to pay you a visit and see how you're managing. How you're managing? They're going to say, what? What? Uh, I can't create, you know, what are you talking about? Say, exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. So, you yourself, and while you're saying this, say, wait, wait, wait. 36 times 36. 36 times 36. Give me the answer. What are they going to do? One of three things. huh? Either he's going to pull out a paper and a pen, or his phone, which has a calculator, or he's going to tell you, give me a few minutes, let me work this one out. Tell him, ya miskeen, ya mhandis, ya doktor, ya sheikh. You can't even multiply two digits by two digits. And you're telling me you know better than Allah? You weird creature. You can't create heavens and earth. You can't multiply two numbers, which shows you where your brain is. And you have the nerve to object to the one who revealed and created everything and gave the system. You're telling me it's not good enough? Go make your own. You can't make your own. So you're part of the system. Deal with it. You're part of the system. And the one who created you knows better than you because he knows what 36 times 36 is and therefore you don't know what you're talking about. And no one can even open his mouth afterwards. Trust me, I've done it. They dumbfounded because they realized that, you know, as Allah described them, أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الْإِنسَانُ أَنَّا خَلَقْنَاهُ مِن نُطْفَةٍ فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُبِينٌ Does the son of Adam not see that we created him from a sperm drop? All of a sudden, he is Qasim on Mubin. He's a quarrelsome creature, fighting and arguing and debating with Allah. Allah, I don't like this rule, and this rule is not good, and this one should be changed. Yes, yeah, yeah, Sheikh, you came from a mucus, man. You like, you know, what? What did you come from? You were nothing but a drop, disgusting, repulsive drop. And Allah made you formulate into bones and flesh and blood and everything. And now you, after you grew up, you go on to object to Allah's deen. So we say to the sisters, know your limits. Don't get all excited, watch some CNN or watch some women's rights movement and then come and start saying, Wallah, no, Islam is oppressing me and Islam is doing this to me because we have women who say this in the name of Islam. Make, giving us a horrible image. And they come on YouTube, come on. They come on YouTube and they have videos about, no, Islam doesn't say this and this is all from hadith and hadith doesn't exist. Uh, the Quran doesn't say this and they play with the deen of Allah coming with no makeup, no hijab, nothing says that Islam doesn't teach hijab. Oh, there's no hijab in Islam. Yeah. So we come, we have all this weird, weird stuff. These are people from the, you know, at the end, they have not submitted to Allah Azza wa So we tell them, you know, sisters, don't get upset with Allah. I'm serious. Don't. Be like the Sahabiyat. Be like the female companions. Be like the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. Submit to Allah Azza wa Jal. Believe me, Allah knows what is best for the creation. Therefore, He gave men this particular degree whom, who, the, who the men should not take advantage of. Tayyib, you may ask about the best of women uh, because we're speaking about the rights, of, uh, you know, the rights of the husband. So a woman, if you want to be the best, if you want to be the best, wow, we're running out of time. Uh, what are you supposed to do? Listen to this hadith. I'm going to read it word for word because I don't want to miss anything out. And it's an authentic tradition. The Prophet ﷺ said, The best of your women are those who are bearers of many children. They produce many children. Loving to their husbands. Comforting and tolerant. Comforting and tolerant. Excuse me. Provided that they have taqwa of Allah. This is the best woman. Now you want to hear the worst woman? The worst of you women are those who display their charms and swagger in their walk. First thing. The worst of women are those who display their charms. What is displaying the charms? Jewelry, rings, bracelets, uh, the whole necklaces, anklets, you name it. Huh? Then the garment itself is an attraction. In and of itself, it's an art of work, you know, it's a piece of art. It's an artwork. Uh, all these colors and sprinkles and glittery stuff, you know, uh, you know, just way overdone. Hello. Then her garment is above the ankles, and the husband's is below the ankles, which is the other way around, and hers is above the ankles. 
confusion between men and women. And then of course, you know, she's wearing some, some weird shoes that show her feet or high heels and all this. And she, when she walks, she swaggers. These are the worst of women. That's the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, do we see this today? Naam. And in another hadith, that among the things which the Prophet ﷺ did not even get to see in his lifetime, Nisa'un kasiyatun, ariyatun, ma'ilatun, mumilatun, ru'usahunna kasminati al-bukht al-ma'ila, la yadkhulna al-jannah, wa la yajidna rihaha, wa in kana riuha yujadu masafati kadha wa kadha. And among the things which the Prophet did not see alayhi sallam, women who are dressed yet naked, they're wearing garment but it doesn't cover. It's either too tight or too transparent or too glittery or too, you know, attractive. And they are ma'ilat and mumilat. They swagger when they walk and they deviate men from the path of Allah. They are fitna for the men. And their heads like the humps of camel, you know, this fashion. This hijab where she has like this, you know, thing sticking out of her head. Like, you know, some rocket landed in her head and then she decided to keep it as fashion. So you're walking around with this big old thing, you know, so what's going on? You have a mountain or something? You know, that's what she has. What, what is the condition with these women? They will not enter Jannah. They will not even smell the fragrance of Jannah, even though you can smell the fragrance from such and such distance. And in other hadith it says, so you curse them because they are cursed. So what are we doing about that? Huh? Sisters. Wallahi, your sisters is not worth it. It is not worth it. You think that, you know, you're enjoying yourself and having fun. Wallah, you can't handle Jahannam. You cannot handle it. So what is this for? Why would you want to display body parts that you will eventually have to pay the ransom of with fire? Every time your skin will roast, Allah will replace it with new skin. So they may taste the punishment. What is it for? If we cannot even put our hand in a toaster, ya shaykh. Put your hand in a toaster that makes sandwiches. The, the biggest, you know, buffest man. Bring the biggest guy over here. Tell him, put your hand in the toaster. Wallah, he won't do it. He will run out of this masjid. Say, what do I need from this? And if he were to put it by mistake, he will scream like a baby for a week. This is the biggest buffest guy. Don't ask about someone my size. We can't handle it. So Jahannam and flagrant, flagrant punishment, consistent, your whole body is immersed so you can have fun in these few steps. You are fitna for yourself and fitna for your husband who's had to deal with all these men checking you out and fitna for the men and fitna for the shayateen all over the place and the malaika walk away and, and disperse from these gatherings of evil and wickedness. The issue of hijab is something that has to be understood. This is not a light matter and there's no oppression there. You know, you cover a jewel. Have you ever seen someone have diamonds and all this, you know, expensive stuff? You put it outside on the balcony? Or do you put it inside a safe and the safe has numbers and you have all this covering and protection because it's a jewel. So we say to the sister, you are supposed to be a diamond, a jewel. You cover that thing, you cover that thing and protect it from all these wicked men in the world. How many rapists do we have? How many wicked people do we have? So the sisters, you know, you know what I'm saying. Um... I'm just going to mention the titles because I don't think you have a lot of time. Uh, prohibition of harming the husband. In a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ from Mu'adh ibn Jabal, if a woman harms in any way her husband, then his wife in Jannah and Paradise tells her, do not harm him. May Allah fight you. He is only staying temporarily with you. Soon he will come to us. Authentic tradition. So remember sister, if you're jealous, because sisters are jealous, if you're really jealous, every time you harm him, Hur al-Ain is already ha has an issue with you. And she's making dua against you. Qatalakillah, may Allah fight you. Stop harming him. He's only with you for some time and soon he's gonna come to us. This is for the righteous husband, of course. So don't harm your husband. If you wanna, you know, keep the Hur al-Ain from making such expressions, then you don't harm him in any way, shape or form. Uh, obey him. That's the, the easiest. The, the, look, the brothers, wallah, listen, the brothers have it tough. For us to go to paradise, we have a lot of things to do. Honestly, look for the sisters what they're supposed to do. Look at this hadith from Abu Hurairah. The Prophet ﷺ said, When a woman prays her five prayers, huh? of course, when she has her menstrual cycle, she doesn't even pray. 
so she gets she gets uh, uh, you know some some leeway there and fasts her month of Ramadan preserves her chastity she protects herself as we explained earlier and obeys her husband huh she is told on the day of judgment enter Jannah from any of its gates you know who gets this the only one we know who gets this is Abu Bakr Siddiq the only one from the Sahaba we know who got this privilege is Abu Bakr Siddiq. After he did what? He gave sabaka and he was fasting and he followed the janazah and he did all these things in one day for him to receive this particular privilege. The woman is said, fast, fast Ramadan, pray your five daily prayers, preserve your chastity, obey your husband and then you will get the same privilege of Abu Bakr Siddiq. And yet the, the, we may fail, the sisters may fail in this very simple task. Not have to do anything else. Subhanallah. Tayyip. Uh, doing things that please the husband. Huh? The Prophet ﷺ was asked, uh, what are, who are the best women? He said, the best of women are those who pleases you when you look at her. Huh? Is the one who pleases you when you look at her, obeys you when you order her, and safeguards you during your absence in regard to herself and your wealth. Very important. Huh? Because, you know, some sisters, man, uh, some sisters, you know, they, 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 you know, when the husband comes home, his wife looks like she was run over by eight trucks simultaneously. You know, one truck hit her, knocked her out, then the next one, then the third one. By the time she, she looked, wearing the, the, the worst clothes ever, and you know, this pajama that, you know, she, she inherited from her grand-grand-grandmother. You know what I'm saying? Her hair is like she was electrocuted. And he comes home, and he was just walking down the street. He saw the neighbor, you know, the lady with all her adornment and charms and perfume walking down the stairs, fitna for him. And then he wants to come home and, you know, find something uh, better than that. And he sees that. And then, you know, they wonder why he has a second wife. Huh? Among the main reasons, or just keep it real. Among the main reasons, there's a second wife. Very often, the brother doesn't get his rights. The sister thinks that she's given him his rights. But there's actually a lot more to it. And you, if you go back, if you go through the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, you will realize what his wives used to do in terms of preparation for being ready for the husband. I, we have young people here, so I really cannot elaborate as much as I wanted. You understand. But uh, sisters have to adorn yourself. When he looks at you, he's supposed to be pleased, not scared. Huh? He's like, am I in the right house? Close back the door. Say, who is this lady inside? Is that you? Yeah, yeah, I'm cleaning. Yeah, Shaykh, uh, you know, I come home at 8 o'clock, is you cleaning? You had all day to clean. But finish cleaning during cleaning time, and before the husband comes, put on your stuff and adornment and charms, and let him feel that he's, you know, he's, instead of going to a nightclub, you know, where all these wicked women are, let him, when he comes home, feel good. And the brothers are laughing because they think that they can get away with it. You can't get away with it either. Some brothers look worse than that. It looks like he was, you know, trying to fly than a rocket went through him and took him to the moon and brought him back. You know, he's looking all with this undergarment, you know, that is, has 16 holes in it and his armpit hair is sticking out. He's sitting like this, he stinks, smells like, you know, lukhiye or uh, spinach or something. And the lady looks at him like, what, what's up with this guy? Well, uh, I'm tired. Takes off his socks, you know, throws one on the TV and the other one on his other son. And uh, the whole area stinks, you know. It's like they put, you know, these yellow signs. Don't, you know, don't come close. <laughs> Hazardous area. Ma go shower, ya mhandis. And you come from, if you know that you're the type of person who sweats and has a bad odor, as soon as you go home, hit the shower. What did the Prophet used to do, alayhi salam? As soon as he would enter home, he would use the siwak. Why? He was, he realized he would be having conversation with his wife. And then his, his mouth may, may not smell as good. I saw him, he was eating maybe at one of the Sahaba or something like that. So he would make sure that his breath, his breath smells nice before he would speak to his wives. This is the breath. Don't ask about that which is worse than the breath. Because you can still speak with your wife without being close enough and get away with the breath. But the body, the body, there's no excuse for that. So the brothers, you know, we have to make sure that we, you know, Islam teaches cleanliness and this whole idea of which we learn from some deviant groups that Islam is, you know, zuhd and asceticism and that you wear some raggedy clothes and you, you look like you don't care about the dunya and you live on top of the mountain. This is a misconception about Islam. The Prophet ﷺ saw a man whose hair was all messed up. He said, what is the matter with this guy? He's like a shaitan. He, yes, he did. And when he spoke about kibir, arrogance, 
When he spoke about arrogance, what did the Sahabi say? He said, Ya Rasulullah, inna ahaduna yuhibbu an yakuna thawbahu hasanan wa na'lahu hasanan. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, he thought Kibir was looking, looking good. He said, one of us would like to have a nice garment and a nice pair of shoes. What did he tell him? He said, inna Allah jameelun yuhibbu al-jamal. Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. Not only he endorsed what he said, but he also gave him further encouragement. He said, Kibr is that you reject the truth and you belittle people. This is Kibr. Not that you look good or you smell good or you, you look after yourself, especially if Allah blessed you with wealth. Now, those who don't have money, no one can open their mouth. Alhamdulillah, you can live Allah nafsan wa sa'ad. This is what the brother can afford. Zallah khairan. But to have money and look, look, you know, in a way that is not becoming is not acceptable. And this is not from Islam in any way, shape or form. And this is not zuhud as the people claim. When, I'm, when I have five minutes left, just tell me. Because that could go on forever. Um, I'm going to skip uh, some, of the, uh, some of the issues pertaining to women because I really want to uh, deal with the other part. The rights of women before they get upset. Uh, brothers, you have to spend on your family. Don't be stin stingy. Huh? Yeah, and it's some... Uh, Overcalculating, especially if he's an accountant. Okay, be careful before. You, if you're an accountant, when you may an accountant, everything has to be calculated. You said what again? And how much was that again? Okay, half a real with this with that. With that. La wallah, wallah, we cannot afford this one. Give us another. Yeah, Shaykh, Allah yarda alaik. We just ask for ice cream. Yeah, ice cream. You know, I'll pay for it. Just uh, the children, haram. This and the car. Wallah, you think? Look, according to my calculation, and this audit at the end of the month, we cannot afford this. Yeah, brother, hang, hang, hang. You know, take it easy. Handle business properly. Be be generous with your family. Spend on them. Make them happy. If Allah gave you wealth, if Allah doesn't give you, didn't give you wealth for a decree or for a reason, He knows best. Then your excuse to be given all these excuses. Know their feelings. The Prophet ﷺ in a very interesting hadith said to Aisha, I know when you are pleased or angry. I know when you are pleased or angry. Aisha replied, how do you know that? He said, when you are pleased with me, you swear by saying, by the God of Muhammad, wa Rabbi Muhammad And when you're upset with me, you say, wa Rabbi Ibrahim. You swear by the Lord of Ibrahim. So she doesn't want to mention the name of the Prophet That's Aisha radiallahu So when she wants to, يعني, uh, oath, give an oath, that's what swearing. Because swearing in English, it's a troublesome word because it means bad language and it means an oath. So she would swear by or oath, give an oath by the Lord of Ibrahim. Meaning she's showing the Prophet that I'm not happy at the moment. And he was والسلام, careful enough to, to, to point that out and to realize that she wasn't happy with him, which means we have to look after the feelings of the woman. When she's not feeling good, try to comfort her. Sometimes we fail in doing so. May Allah forgive us. Understanding their jealousy in love. Women are jealous. And I have to say this, this is probably the most dangerous statement I've ever made or I will ever make in my life. But I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go for it. I have nothing to lose. Sisters and brothers. Sisters first. The same way, the same way you think it's very normal for you to be jealous about the idea of your husband having a second wife, it is very normal for your husband to entertain the idea of having a second wife. If you think it's normal for you to feel this way and this is, this is you know, what is expected, then the men are exactly the opposite. So I'm saying this because some women think that if her husband is thinking about a second wife, what is wrong with you? You criminal, you, you betrayer, you you know, unfaithful creature. And she gives him a, a, many lectures. He didn't commit a crime. The same way you feel this way, he feels the opposite way. It's normal for a man to think of four wives. If you want to know what brothers speak about 80% of the time when they go out for dinner, it's usually food and second wives. Okay? But make sure you don't put a recorder next time your husband goes out, huh? To hear what he's saying. That's what it is. Now, many are not brave enough to really do something about it. Now, he knows when he goes back home, you'll get a couple of smacking here and there. But at the end of the day, this is normal. So don't panic and freak out. Don't panic. It's normal for a man. Allah created them uh, polygamous in this fashion. It's the same way Allah created you jealous. So we have to understand their jealousy. Don't expect it to be, oh, mashallah. Wallah, fantastic news. Where does she live? And let me see her. 
You may find one in 10 bazillion who act like this and the rest of them, she's gonna be upset with you. Same way, sister, understand that this is normal for the brother, so don't be upset with him for having these needs. Uh, complaining and consulting women. From the rights of women is that they are consulted as opposed to being forced to carry out, as I said earlier, the commands of the husband. You know the hadith, the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and the fitna of uh, Salih al-Hudaybiyah. They went all the way to perform Umrah and the uh, kuffar prevented them from having access to Mecca. صح? And then the Prophet ﷺ decided that they will shave their heads صحيح, and return. So he told the Sahaba, who, who, the, of course this was very tough time for the Sahaba. He told them, shave your heads. And they did for, for one of these occasions, because of their jealousy over Islam, they did not do it. They did not do it. So what did the Prophet do, alayhi salam? He entered upon his wife, Ummu Salama. He, the messenger of Allah, who receives wahi from Allah, he receives revelation from the ultimate source, consulted his wife, Ummu Salama. And he told her such and such, he said, look, go back out and don't say a word. Call your barber and tell him to shave your head and khalas. He did exactly that. He went out, told his barber. As soon as the barber started shaving, the Sahaba started fighting with each other over who will cut his hair after. So who, who, who did he get this advice from his wife? Very often, brothers, wallahi, very often our wives are more intelligent in this regard than we are. Sometimes we are taken by pride and manhood and everything and we, work, we make horrible decisions. The wife is the one sometimes who has more rationale than the husband. She's more emotional in, in some areas. And in some areas when we are taken with this manhood you know, nonsense, she is the one who will put you back in your place. So don't get excited. Your boss tells you something you don't like it. Say, I'm going to quit the next day and khalas, I cannot take this oppression from this mudir and he is not worth A, B, C and you start. And then the wife tells you, calm down. Think about your future. Think about us. Think about the kids. And she will be, take, take advice from her. If we don't, sometimes we will destroy ourselves. I saw someone drinking with the left hand. Barakallah feek, drink with your right hand. The shaitan drinks with his left hand. Subhanallah, then the next thing says eating and drinking with them. That's fantastic. Uh, drink, eat and drink with them. Uh, because of course the Jews had these problems where when the women would be on their menstrual cycle, they would send them downstairs. So they have a basement. And when the lady is on her monthly period, they say, yalla, bye bye. And she has to stay downstairs. They would not eat with them because to them, women were in the state of impurity, which they are, but to the extent that they wouldn't even share food and, and lunch and dinner with them. So Islam and the Prophet ﷺ came and changed that. They came to change that. There's no such thing. Even though she's on her menstrual cycle, so what, some things are prohibited at that time. However, spending time with them, loving them and eating with them, that doesn't stop. So eating with the family is, a, is an ideal thing, having a family dinner, you know. And it would be nice if the sister brought a nice table, put a candle, you know, and, and you know, brought the whole family together as opposed to going to a restaurant, for example, every day and spending money. Do something like this at home, instead of the, the family being divided at the time of eating. Brother, from the rights of the sister is that you help her in the household duties. Huh? Uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when, when asked about his manners at home, she said, Aisha, he was helping in doing the family duties and when he hears the call of the prayer, he goes out. Like he doesn't know anyone. So sometimes you may have to wash the dishes. Sometimes you may have to do the laundry. Sometimes you may have to do certain things at home which are considered to be, you know, feminine or, or pertaining to women. But, but there's no such thing in Islam. There's no such thing as Islam. Now, that doesn't mean that the sisters, because some sisters love this. They say, yeah, so the next day she gives you a list. Okay, one day you wash, and one day I wash, and one day you say, hey. Yani, it means that sometimes, when there's a need, you're going to split with me the, the chores of the house. Tab, you go to work one day, and I stay at home too. Well, uh, where's the equality and justice in this one? Huh? So sisters, don't get carried away and make your husband a, you know, a wife with you at home. He is still a man. At the end of the day, this is not really compatible with, with the man in the ultimate sense. Yes, we sacrifice for the sake of, you know, the marital life, but it's not normal for a husband to be a housewife. It is not. Therefore, take that into consideration and respect his manhood. And, and so the sisters have to be considerate and the brothers have to also, when they see that he, they can get involved and help and ease 
the situation for the sister, please يعني, be kind and sweet enough to do so. Uh, yes. Yes. Keeping their privacy. The Prophet وسلم, said the worst rank for a man on the day of judgment is the rank of a man who has relations with his wife and then discloses her privacy. These are among the worst people who and some, some in, in the discussion amongst the brothers or the sisters, they may get carried away with what they discuss in terms of the privacy at home. This is a very serious thing. So what happens at home remains at home. We don't dwell into these issues which are inappropriate and you understand what I'm saying. You have to trust your wives. The Prophet ﷺ forbade, forbade, listen to this, that a man should come unexpectedly to his wife like a night visitor doubting her fidelity and spying into her lapses. In another narration, he did not mention trying to charge them with treason or follow their mistakes. He forbade the men from doing so because some men do so. He tells her, my flight, you know, uh, well, you know, is Sunday, for example, three in the afternoon, and he knows that it is Sunday in the morning or, or Saturday night. So he deceives her because he thinks yani, he's going to catch her in the act, he's going to catch her with a man. He has all these weird thoughts in his mind, and the poor thing has nothing. Has nothing. Of course, if there are reasons to doubt that the woman may be cheating on her husband, then that's a whole other discussion. But that is not the normal behavior. The normal behavior, you have to assume that your wife is faithful to you unless proven otherwise. And you don't be suddenly, you know, popping in and, and, uh, on her in the middle of, of you know, from, from nowhere and, and making her, you know, inspecting as if, because that will hurt her feelings a lot. Specifically, if she's if faithful to you and she says that you are doubting her, it's a major killer for the ladies. So this is something that a brother has to be considerate about. Don't, don't be acting like you're some James Bond, you know, trying to catch her in the act and, you know, some detective or something. Inshallah, she's faithful to you. And sisters, you know, if you, if you behave a certain way, you close the door. If sometimes the husband becomes like this because of the behavior of the sister. She's speaking on the phone with, he doesn't know who. She's always visiting, he doesn't know what. And you know, there are all these, you know, this unusual conduct, which makes him concerned that there may be something going on behind his back. But if the sister is preserving her modesty and avoiding mixing with men and speaking freely with men and strangers, then obviously he wouldn't be thinking any of that. Tayyip. Uh, I think I've, I've uh, uh, said enough in this regard. Again, you know, there are other lectures that address this issue just so we can get it out of the, the way so you will not think because I know there's more to discuss but time is, is not on my side it's one hour 15 minutes that's too bad very bad actually I'm sorry watch these lectures on YouTube okay go to onewaytoparadise.net or the YouTube youtube.com slash onewaytoparadise hello and the lectures are clothing for one another domestic confrontations Domestic confrontations and where is this wedding heading? These are the three lectures that pretty much give you the detail of what you heard in these last couple of days because there there was more time and, and so on and so forth, so it was more manageable. But either way, we dealt with the main main issues. But if you would like to get further details, then you can refer to these lectures, inshallah ta'ala. Zakum Allah khairan for your patience. I apologize for going overboard in, in the time. This is very bad. وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد